Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, it's really my pleasure to introduce tonight some of the members of the Taiwan DEI committees. In the last couple of years that I have been working with Fulbright commissions and posts around the region, um, I have had the privilege and sort of the fun to work with a lot of the members who have come into the Fulbright uh, program in Taiwan. And these um, really wonderful folks who have organized the Taiwan DEI committees. Um, they're going to talk a little bit more about what those committees are and what they're about, but they're basically a self-organized group. Um, so everything that they've been doing has been volunteer. Um, I've been lucky to be involved in some of their events and some of the um, different initiatives that they have organized and put on. Um, and it's been just a really great example of what grantees can do when they're sort of struggling with things like how to talk about their identities or how to address issues of inequity or justice um, when you're living and working in a culture that you may be familiar with or you may be totally unfamiliar with. Um, so I am going to let them get started to introduce themselves uh, this evening because they've got a little bit of something fun planned for introductions. And I also want to say that we are uh, missing one person tonight, Carol Sun, who is an alum of the program, who is one of the first organizers, but she has um, sent us some of her responses to questions, which um, Lily Tang will help us to read out and put some of them in the chat. Um, and we have another member who may hop on later, Sunny, but we'll see if she makes it with us tonight. So um, without any further pauses, I'm going to turn it over to you ladies to introduce yourselves. Okay, I will start this off then. Um, hi everyone, my name is Jocelyn. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I was part of the organizing uh, group within 2021 to, and then all the way up to 2023. So I've been working on the DEI committee for two years. I guess I'll go next. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jamie Ragos. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I was one of the members of 2021 and 2022. I'm currently in the U.S. right now, and it's 6 a.m., so if I'm drinking coffee, just I, it's needed. <laughs> I'll go next. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Lily Tang. I use she, her pronouns. And I was also in the same cohort as Jamie and Jocelyn in um, 2021. I um, was one of the founders of um, the current iteration of Fulbright Taiwan DEI um, or ETA Taiwan DEI because um, Fulbright doesn't like it that we use uh, Fulbright in our name. So we don't, um, which we can go into it more later. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Thomas, and I was a grantee last year, and I'm a current grantee in Taiwan. I was in Zhanghua, and now I'm in Kaohsiung. And I was uh, education co-chair uh, last year and this year as well. So excited to hear about how things got started since I'm kind of on the tail end of this. Um, and then my favorite 7-Eleven snack is there's these spicy chip barbecue chips that are like my absolute favorite and every time I like swing by a convenience store I grab them so that was my fun fact <laughs> did anyone else want to share their favorite uh mini mart snack before we get started um, mine are the sweet oh mine are the seaweed things that like you the seaweed wraps I think with all the rice and stuff because 7-eleven in the U.S. is just not it <laughs> so Uh, not 7-Eleven, but the Family Mart monthly uh, soft serve ice creams are all really fun and they're really cheap. It's a good dessert. Um, I don't really snack. So I think for me, I really like the drinks in 7-Eleven or a Family Mart, like the different fruit juices, um, especially sometimes they do like seasonal ones that I think are really cool and like really interesting. Um, like they'll have like guava juice or they'll have like a carrot juice that's like mixed with other things. Um, so I like I always really enjoy looking at the different drinks. I guess I have to share mine too. Um, we don't have as fancy of the mini marts in Indonesia as they do in Taiwan, but um, we they have like bak pao, which is you know the bao with the different flavors inside. That's like the best mini mart snack late at night. So that's my favorite. 
All right. Well, thanks everyone for taking the time to do this this evening and this morning for some of you really early. Um, Lily, did you want to maybe read to us um, some of the things that Carol had written about how the Taiwan DEI committees got organized and how this all started in the first place since she was one of the founding members? Sure. Um, I can start with Carol's introduction. So Carol um, Sun uses she, they pronouns, was a 2019 to 2021 two-year grantee in Hualien. Uh, Hualien. Um, her, she's currently in California um, and she's pursuing her master's in social work. Um, so she's doing her graduate degree. Um, her favorite semi-lemon snack is is those spicy nori potato chips that are supposed to, in quotes, to be Japanese, but I actually struggled to find them in Japan. Um, and so, so how um, she and Sunny um, got started um, with organizing was, this is Carol's answer, I will toss all these into the chat um, afterwards. So she says, in my first year, 2019, 2020, I noticed a lot of struggles from ETAs, particularly people of color or non-white passing women, and how there was no infrastructure within the Fulbright program to support them. Assessing, um, accessing any type of emotional or psychosocial resource was inconvenient. For example, in those days, I remember we had to go to Taipei to see English-speaking counselors um, not associated with Fulbright. Um, she meant like mental health counselors. The trip and hotel stay was not reimbursed, and we had to take our sick and vacation dates. I myself, speak Carol, um, dealt with some really inappropriate situations. As someone who has direct heritage and connection with Taiwan, I also find, found myself con a constant mediator and educator for locals and peers. Some who were not raised by Taiwanese people appeared wildly unprepared in dealing with Taiwanese culture. Understandable, but not the standard I believe and that I wanted to be held to. A lot of ignorance um, going on for people who are not supposed to be cultural ambassadors or role models um, and who... Um, uh, who treated kind of this experience as like a tourism experience and not as like a um, opportunity to like teach and learn from Taiwan. Overall, a lack of humility despite potentially good intentions. EDAs who are compassionate and motivated and champion the values of social justice could only deal with Taiwanese political and social problems through an American lens, not in a culturally appropriate way. Um, in the summer, I got involved with a few others to discuss the issues we were facing and how to appeal to the Taiwan office and Dr. Nadeau. This began um, our journey for Fulbright to be more inclusive for our ETAs and more sensitive and educated when dealing with our Taiwanese community. So that is her answer. Um, I will drop that into the chat. Thanks, Lily. Um, I guess, you know, moving out from that, um, it would be great to know a little bit about like, what are some of the kinds of activities and events that the Taiwan DEI committees do? And I don't know if Jocelyn and Sarah, if you want to try and take that on. I can first kind of start out. Um, so I think, so that was during, you know, when Kara's talking about 20, uh, what, 20, 2020, 2021 era. So that I think that was also around like COVID. So I don't know if that like influenced any of the organizing and like just setting things up. But I really felt that, especially during like the 2022 and 2023 year, there were like a lot of events that we did, but also during um, that modeled after the time during 2021 as well. Um, but I can maybe speak a little bit on 2021 and then Sarah, you can talk about the stuff during 2022. Um, during 2021, we did, a, like, one of the major events that we did was the LGBTQIA, um, discussion with, um, the Professor Wen Liu, um, which was really awesome. Um, and then we also did a real, another big one that was about, um, Indigenous people in Taiwan, and that was organized, um, with, through Pai and Lily, and that was also a really amazing event, um, where we were able to engage with a lot of, um, key stakeholders or people who are part of the indigenous councils to kind of hear what were kind of the issues that were happening within Taiwan. Um, so those are kind of like the big online events that we did, but we also would do a mixture of um, social, I guess like educational things that we would send via um, Instagram. So within the education committee, when Jamie and I were working together, we also did a lot of um, various lesson plans that we would share um, to people as um, for ways for 
school writers to engage in DEI issues within the classroom and hopefully making it approachable um, and uh, for them as well. And if anyone else wants to make additional comments, feel free. To kind of jump, to kind of backtrack a little bit, um, I, I'll provide a little bit a summary connecting Sunny and Carol's work um, to what like essentially is the current structure. Um, I think that will bring a little bit more clarity of like what is the structural organization of, you know, the ETA Taiwan um, program. So, um, so essentially Sunny and Carol, um, they informally um, organized um, back in 2019, 2020, um, just through like a lot of like individual conversations with both Dr. Nadeau and, um, and Kelly, who um, is one of the main administrators and directors at in the Fulbright Taiwan program. Um, she's Taiwanese. And her and Dr. Nokdo are like kind of the main like le leaders in Fulbright Taiwan. So I'm sure there's like e equivalents of um of both like Dr. Nadeau and Kelly in um your y'all's respective programs. So um Sunny and Carol is started like just like informal conversations just being like hey like we observe a lot of these things happening on the ground we feel like it's a shared experience for example like you know navigating cultural issues navigating you know various like um racisms etc cetera, etc cetera, um both like imported from like Americans just being in Taiwan and maybe not thinking too much about like their identity critically right if, things like that um so then they were like hey like you know, how can we, you know, use the Fulbright program and um, create some resources that will support students of uh, Fulbrighters of color here in Taiwan. So that's kind of how um, Sunny and Carol started the, the ball um, and got the ball rolling. So they brought, they were, um, they kind of like sparked Dr. Nadeau's, I think, like um, interest and awareness of these problems, because I believe he was like pretty much new um, to the Fulbright Taiwan program at that point. He just, I think, became director. Um, and he was like very receptive. So like we really like give props to him for that, um, which made our lives when we came in as ETAs um, a lot easier. Um, and when we want when we start to organize. So in um, so we entered 2021, right? Um, we actually were supposed to come to Taiwan like summer of 2021, but then due to COVID, we ended up going to Taiwan in October. And in between that time, you know, we witnessed like the social upheaval um, in the United States, right? The police brutality, Black Lives Matter, um, South Asian hate, like um, the pandemic, right? Like we saw so much like violence and um, and like the hate crimes and just like how the US government was also like failing to respond to the moment. Um, so then like as now full writers, we're like, hey, like how do we utilize our privilege as American citizens and as Fulbrighters um, to actually create change? Um, like we want to walk to walk and not talk to talk. So um, how we started was actually virtually because midst of the pandemic, we were all all over the 50 states, um, not yet in Taiwan. So we organized a lot of like um, virtual conversations among ETAs very informally. And we come we came up with a letter that we uh, drafted um, kind of outlining like our the values that we believe that Fulbright program should hold, right, to be anti-racist, to be um, to really support um, the the Fulbrighters of color, and to also respond to the current social moment, and you know stand for justice, right? Like you can't say cultural exchange and you know we want to create a better world and not actually um, do all those things, right? Um, so through that we um, found that like. Uh, we got connected with um, Jane, who's amazing. She was she's um, she's working as their like mental health counselor and as well as like cult cross cultural communicator. I don't remember her current title since this was like two years ago, but um, at that point that was her title. I believe she's still part of Fulbright, um, and she was really wonderful in being like the bridge between us as incoming ETAs and also um, the Fulbright Taiwan program. And through that, that's how we started to form the backbone and like the skeleton for what became ET Taiwan DEI. Um, definitely a lot of hardship, a lot of communicating, like crafting this vision and also implementing. Um, it's not perfect by all means, but that's kind of how, the, like that was kind of the starting point. And, um, and also how we ended up from the Carol and Sunny era to us. Sarah, did you want to talk a little bit about, since you have now sort of taken on the mantle of this, um, a little bit about what um, activities and events you all have planned in the time that you've been at Fulbright Taiwan and maybe about some of the things that you're hoping to do in the next year? Yeah, sure. Um, I can also maybe start with what does DI look like currently? Um, 
So we are divided into three committees and there was actually a discussion we had earlier on about do we want to be more like thematic based? So previously it was focusing on uh, engagement, empowerment and education. And then there was some discussion on these are kind of vague topics and you know, how do we decide what to do? Should we be more um, like task-based? So like an event planning group, a uh, resource collection and creation group. But I think in, uh, we decided to stick with the original three thematic base and just try to be more intentional with um, different committees and what goals they want to work towards and uh, what aims they would like to accomplish. So last year's, um, it was a mix of mainly in-person, but there was, uh, sorry, mainly virtual, just due to the fact that we have people all over the island of Taiwan. Um, so it's really hard to do things in person because you even have people on islands off of Taiwan that need to fly to access it. So usually the only in-person opportunities we have are at conferences. For example, but at, at a lot of conferences, we've recently been invited to lead uh, DEI groups, like small groups or discussion groups. Um, so that's been something that's really nice. And we hope to continue that partnership um, during these, um, like only the like three times a year where everyone is in the same space. Um, but last year we did different activities um, and events. So there was an event of talking about disability justice in Taiwan. There was um, screenings at like local uh, cohorts. Um, and then there was a panel talking about migrant workers in Taiwan that the engagement committee did. Uh, education committee also did, um, had a speaker present about language revitalization effort she has for a local indigenous group in Taiwan, which was really cool. And I feel like a lot of people connected to her since she's an educator and she shared the struggles of working with middle schoolers, as well as like picture books and other materials that she had provided. Um, and then just some other things, uh, we experimented with a bunch of different things. We did uh, resource collection, we did spotlights of lessons. We tried to share out stuff that the education committee made. Um, we did a info session about Ramadan where people could join to learn more about the holiday, how to teach about it, how to support students or coworkers or fellow um, cohort members. Um, we had an event with PRISM talking about queer education educators in Taiwan. And then we even were able to have an event with advisors that are in Taiwan to discuss potential careers or you know, future directions post their grant here. Um, so that was, we did uh, uh, other things within DI as well, like meetups um, and just like social uh, gatherings just to kind of boost community, which I also really appreciated. And then as far as this year, um, we've already had one event, uh, Black in Taiwan, where we had some ETFs share about experience, and then there was breakout groups for discussion. And I know the that committee is con uh, considering continuing that, um, how to expand it to events on allyship, uh, opening up to other affinity groups, things like that, um, in addition to resource collection. Uh, for education, we hope to start um, a newsletter to document ETA and ETF experience, um, the strengths and weaknesses they've had, any advice they have, maybe some reflect like pieces, reflective pieces on, you know, being a guest in Taiwan, talking about the events that happen at conferences and how people um, like the reactions to certain things and different perspectives. Um, we're hoping to have some book clubs. Um, I'm hoping to have a special education panel. And then um, additionally, there's a, sign that, a zine that people are interested in making, talking about um, Taiwan's history, maybe a, a map that they were talking about that can be shared to show like significant historical spaces and historical spaces in Taiwan. Um, and then during the mid-year conference, potentially having talking groups on like colonialism 
and our positionality as American English teachers in Taiwan. So those are just some certain things um, in the like, allying with advocacy groups in Taiwan. So rather like uplifting local voices rather than necessarily us creating or um, doing everything from scratch. So just getting how to get involved with the community. So those are just some current plans of our committees, but I think things are still very flexible and up in the air. And I think a lot of it depends on people's passions, the connections we make. I think a lot of times it's like, oh, you just meet a really great speaker and you wanna invite them to come or you find a really nice connection. So things are still up in the air, but those are some of the plans we have for this year. Thanks, Sarah. It's pretty incredible listening to you just like list off all of the events and things that have happened over the last year or two. Um, because of course, this is in addition to all of you working as ETAs or ETFs. And so you have a lot of responsibilities for your actual Fulbright grants. Um, so I guess I wanted to ask for all of you, you know, this is a lot of extra work that you're doing, obviously, and you're doing it as volunteers. Um, so why was it important to all of you to engage with these kinds of um, DEIA kinds of topics or work while you were on your Fulbright? And this is open to anybody to answer. Um, for me, I think the reason why I needed to do that is one, I wanted to educate myself to see where, um, the topics were in Taiwan compared to like where we were in the US and just figure it out. And then I also wanted to like change the perception of a little bit of my students because a lot of them, they were like, wait, you're American? You're not my per like typical perception of, of an American. And I want to show that American can be many things. You can have the heritage tied to Taiwan. You can have the heritage tied to wherever else, but you're still an American by like some identity. So like showing that America has like a lot of different diverse people, religions, um, queer identities and things like that. So I wanted to like show my students that I am, even though I am, I look a little bit like them, I may have like a heritage tie. I am still, there is some part of me that like was born in America, has that American culture and like showing that you can have a mix of cultures that you can still honor your cultures from like other different identities and that it's, but you still have that mix as well. For me personally, um, I knew coming into this position, I had a lot of privilege with me. You know, I was white. I look like the stereotypical American. The power of English, you know, is this really strong. Um, and I know I was making a very competitive salary um, in Taiwan compared to like my co-teachers. Um, so being conscious of that, I wanted to put work into DEI. Um, also my past experience with culturally responsive teaching, both with my education courses and then working as a teacher in the US, I found really rewarding. Um, but I know that as a new teacher, like approaching DEI, and figuring out how to include that in a classroom context can be a bit daunting uh, and maybe overwhelming if you're just trying to like survive a day at school as a teacher. Um, so I wanted to maybe like share what I had learned and um, some resources that I had found helpful. Uh, in addition to, uh, I think Jamie mentioned it as well in the beginning of her response. I just wanted to learn more about what uh, social issues looked like in Taiwan um, and inform myself more because I was not super uh, aware of everything and I'm still learning through this DEI context and I really enjoy it. Um, so those were the three, I think, main points that uh, inspired me to apply and continue this year. Um, I think coming into a lot of it was, especially after COVID and feeling, and like Black Lives Matter movement, feeling like the need and want to like engage and being in this type of community I also was really active um within social space within college but I also knew that like coming within Fulbright you know that is part of a larger like colonial project of spreading like English and like I kind of struggled with like my positionality and like coming here and being part of that so I felt that the I was a way for me to kind of look at it in like a critical lens and just be critical of the things that I was I guess, taking a part of, like, even within Fulbright as well, and I felt that, like, being in this space, too, there was a lot of people who were willing to, 
to have these kind of like critical conversations. And I also wanted to find a way to um, engage in local issues too, because I felt that was really important in order to understand like the lives of my students. It was really important to know um, their history, what's going on with them. And then also, um, yeah, to give them a more diverse perspective on the world and hopefully get them um, interested in these type of um, things. And I think what I what was really interesting in all of this was just like, yeah, the American perspective is obviously really different from what Taiwanese people view with like DEI. Um, so that was uh, really interesting as well in terms of like working with admin. Um, but yeah, these were, I felt like through um, engaging in DEI, it was, it gave me like a way or to kind of investigate like deeper, like I wouldn't have, like the language of revitalization event was, uh, the speaker was a person that I met through um, like a local professor that I was working with. And I don't think without the space of like having kind of like DEI, I wouldn't have been able to like kind of have a reason to kind of like talk to her like hey like I think what you're doing is so cool like can you come and speak for this event I think uh DI really allowed me to kind of give me a reason to kind of engage further so talking about the differences in sort of the way in which we approach DEI or DEIA um, as a set of terms or ideas in the United States versus in other places in the world, um, I'm curious to hear what kinds of challenges you also ran into as you were trying to organize these committees um, or maybe just working with the Fulbright administration and sort of trying to encourage that there needs to be more space um, to talk about these kinds of issues within the Fulbright program, because I think that's in some some ways having a designated sort of space for this is something fairly new within the Fulbright program. Um, and maybe Lily, you can share a little bit about um, what Carol had said since she was on the sort of pioneering first wave of this. Yep, um, I will read a, a brief snippet of Carol's um, and then I'll add the rest to the chat. Um, so one challenge that Carol faced was um, cultivating trust and rapport with the Fulbright office and staff there. Um, so this is what she said. I'm telling my advice for, to those of you who are interested in starting DI work for, for those who are inheriting some formalized role or system of DI engagement. Um, this information may help you maintain rapport and trust um, with your country's staff members. Um, before you approach a staff member with your feedback or an agenda, some good questions to ask for yourself are, what is their role or function within the office and program? What other important people do they engage with? Why are they doing this job? And what challenges might they face? If you don't know us, we want to humanize them and recognize their limitations within a much larger and unique system, a system that we Americans are unfamiliar with that will help us manage our own expectations. It is also respectful to observe and acknowledge that they what they have done for us. You can talk to alumni or coordinators or ask your LETs if they notice a trend um, of change. For first years, particularly, LETs may not realize what is going on behind the scene. Um, so then like later on, um, she kind of shared about her experience, um, how when she first started off, there was no infrastructure um, that existed um, and that like she wanted to change that. Um, but then as a result, there was like um, issues with how, like, which staff members to engage with and, like, how to engage with them because there was never a formalized pipeline. Um, so thanks to kind of their efforts, we were, you know, they were, um, like, the Fulbright office also have to adapt, right? Like, when we ask for these requests, they also have to be like, okay, now, you know, which staff do we assign to this role? So she sp um, speaks about um, kind of navigating that. Um, I'll drop the rest of her um, story into the chat so that y'all can read it. Thanks, Lily. Um, I know there were a lot of challenges. I've seen some of these in the last couple of years. And I think that um, one of the, the things that you all have really achieved was to create this really great working relationship with the Fulbright administration in Taiwan. And even with, um, I don't know if everyone's familiar with the Taiwan program, but they have um, basically Taiwanese advisors who work with them um, in the different regions. So the ETA groups in the different parts of Taiwan also have Taiwanese advisors that help them out with things. And I think even for the advisors, it's been like a really 
interesting experience, like engaging with all of you on these topics. It's been a way that you've gotten to know them and their cultures better, and they've gotten to know you and American culture better. Um, I've had some of these, you know, the advisors say to me, like, this has been the most exciting part of what we've been doing. Um, so it's just really built a really, I think, beautiful relationship, um, out, you know, with some difficulty and some challenges in communicating from the beginning, but you've really been successful in doing that in over the past couple of years. And now when I go to orientation, there's all sorts of activities surrounding DEIA. Um, the staff is very excited and engaged about these activities and about exploring these topics too. And so um, I think it's just a testament to all of the work that everybody in the committees has done, trying to sort of not give up when communication got difficult or when there seemed to be some resistance that people tried really hard to work together and communicate with the administration to make some of these things happen. Um, I'm wondering if one of you would be willing to share, maybe Jamie, because you mentioned it earlier, um, a little bit about like just an example of how you integrated some of these DEI sort of issues into the classroom, because people often ask me about this when I go to orientations, when they're starting to, you know, think about what they're going to be teaching. How do you talk about identity or Americanness in a classroom with um, perhaps really young students or students that don't have a great level of English to begin with? So it's going to be difficult to communicate some of these complicated topics. Um, so for me, I had taught from first grade to sixth grade. So I had the like young students to like older students. So um, luckily we do have a good relation, working relationship with like local English teachers and they would help me translate within it. But like a lot of the local English teachers goals were to get some type of English vocabulary in there. So I had a compromise in like teaching about like a social justice issue in like an easy way but like get my let to help like um but get some english vocab in there so like for example for like little students teaching them about like queer identities and pride it would be an easy way to like integrate colors when you talk about like the rainbow and like getting them to repeat the colors of the rainbow and then talking about how that symbol has evolved over time to show queer identity and so they can learn colors but then a little bit just like at a lower language and then i would also find like a few little stories online that were easy for like picture books have like um subtitles in chinese but like they could be listening to the english versions of that um when the um when i was in taiwan like my one of my let's really want to talk about like refugees um because it was the, during the time ukraine and russia were having started um so she was like how can we incorporate this into our lesson plan and so i had a small little story about like um how to like that had the like repeating sentence about i am a refugee or like talking about like the journey that refugees go through um and so i got the students to repeat that sentence and like listen to the story and then another thing we did is to like just look at emotions to see how people are feeling throughout that time so um we would show pictures about like being scared and so how you would talk through that and so um like have like an eyeball and like what was this emotion and then go through that english vocabulary as well so incorporating like some simple phrases or having one target language and then trying to like do a little bit of history or talk about like how things have changed over time so your students can like learn and get a little story within it is how um that's how i've like slowly incorporated from lower levels to higher levels and then i know if you can get into high school who in like a little bit older language levels you can talk about it in a little bit more mature way Um, I think another fun thing um, that like folks can do that I was able to do in my classroom was like during the holidays, like um, the holiday season um, expanding beyond like Christmas, um, for example, like Kwanzaa and like, and also in your like PowerPoint slides, like, you re like really making sure that you're picking like diverse photos, like, you know, folks of different skin tones, different cultures, backgrounds, et cetera. Like, I think those little details really matter. Um, because like something that we kind of realized um, via like just like resource sharing among the ETAs was that sometimes the English avail um, English like books or, you know, resources that's available um, in in Taiwan um, are kind of like 
unfortunately a little bit stereotypical like and I don't think it's the fault of at all of like the like the Taiwanese publishing companies or anything but rather like the stuff that gets imported into Taiwan for example one of our friends um who was in ETA with us um they found like a um storybook that was in their classroom and it was essentially being like oh an American classroom you have like a roof over your head and you have a whiteboard and your teacher is like nice like you know environment this is like a children's book and then they're like for some reason they're like oh classrooms in Africa you're like sitting outside you're like there's like no roof over your head and like you know and and it's like wait what and like this was like and you know for 100 this book did not come from any african nation right like this book was not published by like um a publisher and um in like Africa, right? Like it's 100% a book that originated somewhere from like from the West. And it's like, okay, so if this is the type of materials that for somehow ended up in like your public school system in Taiwan, that's a problem. So um, kind of like thinking about like what resources are available and how we as ETAs can be intentional about what we bring into the classroom, right? Like otherwise we might unfortunately just reinforce stereotypes. Um, so if one thing that I did actually was I organized like a um, like book, like, um, donation. Like I had folks back home if they wanted to send, um, send over to Taiwan, like, um, diversity, like books that like highlight diversity, like, um, um, and I was actually able to donate a bunch of those books, um, to, to my school, to my elementary school. Um, and it was really great because, um, this again came, um, post like, you know, the um, activism of the 2020s. So there was a lot of like sites being like, oh, here are some, you know, young children's books that you should, you know, um, expose like young kids do to like normalize, like that, like everybody can be like the main characters of their stories. Right. And like, through these like lists that are now readily, very readily available online, I was able to kind of curate like a list and get those books and bring them to my school. Um, so I think little things like that, like thinking about like, how do you enrich the like curriculum and what week as like ETAs um, coming in with like books not, you know, published in the 1980s <laughs> could do with like these new resources. That's a little bit more sensitive, um, culturally sensitive and relevant, so. Thanks, Lily. Um, those are some great ideas. And I I hope that, you know, from starting these conversations, we can start to also build some more networks between different programs in the region, because I think that a lot of ETAs struggle with the same questions. You know, where do I find materials? How do I talk about these issues when they come up um, in a way that's appropriate and culturally sensitive, but also sort of corresponds to who I am as an American and things like that. So um, I think it's something we can think about also for the future is how do we like sort of connect and, and communicate and share um, some of the things that you all have achieved um, and make this something that um, sort of will last through time. And I guess that leads us also to this question of sustainability for these kinds of efforts. Um, you know, what are you all thinking about how to see this into the future since your grants may be one year or two years, but you're not necessarily going to be in the program. So any of you who would want to give your input on how to make these kinds of efforts sustainable and, and um, how to keep them going for the future of programs like Fulbright Taiwan. Um, I think in like, in terms of sustainability, I've been thinking a lot about like the folks who stay, right? Like the folks who not only um, stay for their ETA year, but their ETF year, I did not. Um, however, um, I have, like, we have friends in the program who are now like third year ETFs. Um, in particular, um, I want to name Salali. Um, she's an amazing organizer. She organized um, for ethnic studies um, during her college years. And then now um, in Fulbright, she, um, in the first two years, she was um, pivotal in like the initial formation of ETA Taiwan DEI um, through like just supporting us behind the scenes, but not active, but not actually being a member. Um, and like, you know, we lean a lot on her and her like experience with organizing and like um, knowledge of social justice, et cetera. Um, and now that she's in her third year, like something that, you know, I've been in conversation with her about is that like, is the, the, like the importance of relationships, like, because she's, you know, this is her third year, she's been able to build like really good relationship and trust between not only her and her cohort and her coordinator, um, but also with like the Fulbright Taiwan program. And even when she was not part of ETA Taiwan DEI, she still like got flagged um, by Fulbright Taiwan to lead um, workshops during conferences and stuff. And obviously that's a lot of um, emotional, physical labor that she is not compensated for, right? Um, 
I think it's also in terms of sustainability, like acknowledging that like um, for folks who decide to join like ETA Taiwan DEI, um, what we get out of it is like maybe something to put on our resume, right? Outside of the, you know, the work, it's like, okay, like some, you know, some people might just join and do this work because they want that on their resume. But for folks who are behind the scenes who say, hey, like I don't want to be part of this organization, but I will do the work. I think a lot of times their efforts are like unacknowledged. So I definitely like want to shout out her and like the efforts that I see her pour into not only her community, but like the relationships that she's building with Taiwanese staff um, so that they trust her and that so that they know, hey, like they, you know, they both want the best for the students and for the Taiwanese community. And she's definitely an example of someone who like through relationships have been able to build that sustainability and conversation around DEI, even when it's not in a formal structure like what we're talking about right now. Obviously, again, lots of emotional labor, like um, huge props to her um, for like all she does. Um, so. I think another comment about that, especially in terms of emotional, right? I guess what I've observed from people who maybe have done a lot of work, maybe their first year, like I've met some people who are in the committees last year, but then this year didn't really feel like joining because I think they wanted to be compensated for their time and their labor. And I think it's really great, like now that we're being asked to like, you know, we have a seat in the table of like being able to like be part of the discussion. I think what's frustrating for sometimes is like, okay, I think as because we have a seat in the table, they know that we're going to put in the work, but then they're not really paying us for that time. So I think some people are turn off by it so they maybe don't want to engage in specifically maybe in just like DEI as an organization but I think they're still doing you know their own work independent from us which I mean they're still engaging in their own ways and building these relationships like Solly was doing for the past two years even before she decided to join this year so I think that's another big thing of maybe thinking about how we can try to get FSC to pay people for the work that we're doing so I think FSC has paid people for work in terms of like leading just workshops in general and it doesn't have to and then not always DEI focused but I think I remember when we were trying to even get some people compensated last year um and we we're like hey like I think we should really try to compensate people like just you know ETAs you know for the work they're doing that was met with resistance but you know even before all that too we even struggled to even get like funding as well for like their speakers. So like only for these past like two years, we were able to finally get FSC to like give um, honorariums even for our our speakers and our interpreters. So that has been like a really big move. So I think those are just some things about, I guess, sustainability in terms of paying people for their time. Cause yes, it is really tiring. And like, if we already have, we're so busy with doing our, you know, eight to four, classes on top of lesson planning and then having to like meet almost every single week or maybe twice a week for some people if you're like a co-chair it can get really really exhausting so yeah also putting having space also for rest and community and joy not just always planning so yeah it's a balance of all that Yeah, I think this is definitely a challenge in general for the Fulbright program is how do we integrate DEI issues and concerns and topics and coverage and space into the program in a way that is long term, not just when people bring it up, um, you know, year to year. Some of the programs um, like in the EAP region, there is no option to have a second year, so you wouldn't even necessarily have second year ETAs or ETFs to kind of you know, lead people um, through some of these activities and like sort of some turnover to to sort of give them the information about what happened the year before. So, you know, Fulbright as a program, how do we build that kind of infrastructure so that these things are part of the program, they are compensated in some way so that people aren't doing so much additional labor, even if they want to, um, this should be an important part of the program as well. And I think, you know, you all have sort of demonstrated that in talking about all this work that you've done that's been by volunteer labor alone and uncompensated, but it's so important. Um, and it's so important that the program makes that like part of the infrastructure rather than just an extra thing, because DEI can never just be an extra. It really has to be part of everything that we do. Um, I just want to pause and say hi to Sunny because she's popped in. <laughs> We're glad to see her. Sunny, do you want to say hi and introduce yourself quick? And um, 
We're going to probably open up for questions in a second, but I'd like to give you a second to talk a little bit about your role with the committees as well. Hi, good morning or good evening, everyone. Sorry I'm late. Uh, final season, also preparing for consulting interviews. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, lovely to meet you. Uh, I and Carol and I were part of the first DI task force. I mean, got it started when Dr. Nadeau took office um, the year after. It was, an, it was an interesting experience. Learned a lot, burned out a lot, frankly, but really proud of all the work that Lily, Jamie, and Jocelyn have done to take it to the next level. Honestly, super proud. They really did take it to the next level and happy to answer any questions about what it was like. Um, I'm sure that you covered it already, but yeah, do have some thoughts on how to work with administration and what was the difficulties involved. Thanks, Sunny. I'm glad you were able to join us. Um, I do want to give some space to folks who are in the audience. If you have any questions, you can um, write them into the chat. You can also turn your camera on and say hi if you'd like to ask anything. Um, we've got a few more minutes here. Um, we can stretch a little bit past the end of the hour if necessary. Um, while you all are thinking about questions that you might have, um, I wanted to ask for all of you sort of as like a way to wrap this up. Like, Either what did engaging with these committees or engaging with DEI issues in a more sort of intentional way, um, what impact did it have on your Fulbright or what impact has it had on you and what you've been doing after your Fulbright? So it would be great just to hear from some of you who are alums too, like did this you know, lead to any changes in what you decided to do after your Fulbright or what you pursued or even in applying for jobs or for grad school and things like that? I can read um, Carol's comment first. Um, okay, so uh, Carol wrote, uh, DI engagement did not necessarily influence my path after returning home, but it definitely informed my life and how I approached my work as a social worker. Um, she considers Sunny to be one of her closest friends after going through the thick and thin of DEI. So um, she says maybe all y'all would also make a friend for life. Um, also, um, she says, I felt a huge bump with the first year ETs during the till and my DEI engagement. And quite frankly, that experience forced me to mature as a leader and deeply evaluate my stance and intention as someone who values justice, equity, competency, and progress. I would like to also add that the Fulbright experience in general has been so helpful and rich in nearly every aspect of my life, from learning how to function appropriately in a new environment to defining ethical behavior in a work profession, to overall learning how to be more cooperative, compassionate, and effective advocate for myself and others in need. I still dream often about my students. I, I dearly miss the community that embraced me. Um, that is Carol's response. I just wanted to echo everything that Carol said. Carol is one of my best friends for life. Definitely, you know, a wedding, like not just a wedding invite member, but like a like wedding party <laughs> friend. Uh, how honest am I allowed to be? <laughs> uh, okay, I will agree with everything that Carol said. I would say that Fulbright was a transformative experience. DI work really tired me out. Um, I... Honestly, I'm not sure how much I want to stake my career on it in the future uh, because it is definitely optics driven. I have had some challenging experiences that I don't know how much I want to take into the business world so far because I've been hurt by it, but it was also a great learning experience. Employers definitely want to talk to me about it, um, especially in this competitive economy. And yeah, um, I've been remained inspired by people and I learned how DI could work in engaging the local community because in order to um, do good DI work, we really need to bring in the community into this. And unfortunately, we see in if you when we go back to the US professional world, it's it's even more challenging. So this is a good opportunity for that. But it was also it was a wonderful um, time to build community, and I'm proud of the work that we did. 
Um, for me personally, I still want to do DEI work. Um, I'm currently in med school right now. And um, one of the things that is so insane in the medical field is that when we're learning about different presentations with like just in skin tones, um, we learn of like color changes of like, oh, this turns red, this turns thing, but we don't know how they like are shown on like different skin colors and skin tones. So like one of the things that I've done like um, within my position since I'm someone who helps with curriculum at um, my medical school is just send resources of like, oh, hey, this is how the skin change presents on a darker skin tone. It might be a little bit more purple, might be a little bit more gray, because for us, it's very important to know how like these different uh, diseases present on like different skin tones because we're taking care of humans and we need to make sure they're alive in the end of the day. And so like, I want to like, that's how, um, that's influenced my career and future. Um, I know I want to go into academic medicine as of right now. I am very much interested in like learning and working with underserved communities. So um, we do a, we do help like the community here. I'm in Memphis, Tennessee, which does have um, a predominantly black population. So we integrate um, working with the community, teaching about like uh, STIs um, and like other contraception. And then here, um, Tennessee is also one of the most uh, restrictive states on abortion. So we uh, also talk about like what we can do and how that impacts like different people throughout the social determinants of health. And then we're trying to like influence that and show how important social determinants of health are for the medical field and especially within our infrastructure at the US. Um, within my Fulbright, um, Lily and Jocelyn are two of my really good friends from Fulbright. Like I still talk to Lily every once in a while being like, this really, really sucks. I'm really annoyed with like what's going on with admin and everything. And I remember waking up at 4 a.m. one day to talk to Jocelyn just um, randomly about her ETA experience. Um, but like it brought me a sense of community because like even within my like local cohort that I was with, like I did have a few good friends, but I feel like my like closer friends were through engaging on DEI work and I really liked planning lessons and like show, finding different resources like I um that's something that I still like doing to this day and that's why I chose this position at my medical school to look into like curriculum development to help with that well, we're coming up on the hour here. I don't see that we have any questions in the chat for now. So I'm just wondering if you have any final thoughts that you want to share. I want to thank all of you too for all of the work that you've done, for also for sharing tonight. And um, we had some challenges in trying to schedule everyone in different points across the world. Um, so thanks so much for for doing this. Um, I'm really excited to be able to share this with um, you know some of the other programs and other ETAs and other Fulbright grantees in the region, and also just to have this as a document of, you know, how these committees came about and all of the work that people have put into it, because it's really, as I said earlier, has been a phenomenal effort on the part of all the people that are here today and some of the people that we're not seeing that we're also working on these committees. Um, and I think it's a model that hopefully can be integrated and more supported into Fulbright programs worldwide. Um, you know, that's something that we definitely have to work on. And I think the points that have been made um, in this panel today about, you know, needing to recognize the kind of labor that goes into these efforts and make it part of this, like centered in the program rather than just something that's peripheral to the program, you know, and that means compensation and understanding the kinds of time and effort that people put in um, to making these kinds of events happen and to making sure that DEIA is like central to what we're thinking about in higher education exchange. So um, thank you all very much. Oh, we have one question, yay. <laughs> um, do you have recommendations for resources to go to to incorporate DEIA activities and values in the classroom? I know our Instagram, um, the ETA Taiwan DEI had like a few little lesson plans or like little stories that you can look at to like, and then um, modify them to fit your needs at um, wherever you're at, Dara, um, to like, uh, to modify like how your classroom structure set up. Um, we have a little bit of like literature and books that um, for like AAPI month, we had like a few things here and there that could help with in trying to integrate our stories and lesson plans. And shout out to Jamie, um, who despite a broken ankle were the, was the one who compiled and made all those uh, posts 
back then. So if you scroll to 2021 and uh, you see all those posts, uh, it was uh, Jamie. So shout out to her. I guess like lastly, like something that I just want to share too um, about like just DEI in general, like obviously the concept of DEI um, is imperfect, right? Like there's a ton of um, like, you know, writing and criticism and critique around like what exactly is DEI, what purpose does it serve and like, um, and what format should it look like, especially when now that it's entered the mainstream, oftentimes these values can be co-opted, right? Um, same thing as like, you know, like um, essentially like, pink washing or you know like just some um, you know like um just the forces of capitalism right like it will water down like these efforts um however um as such like it's even more important that each one of us who you know care who are you know who are and who are entering this work um despite that to um to continue to I think self-critique and push ourselves to like figure out you know if we are making the right choices and to not be afraid to um you know like um keep ourselves accountable in this work right like all of us um enter with very different lenses different perspectives and it's an opportunity to like learn from each other um additionally I think it's also like something that we talked a lot about um during our time in 2021 was about like harm reduction right like fundamentally as Fulbrighters representing America you know funded by the State Department. Um, we are not innocent in the American imperialism project, right? As much as we are trying to push against it, right? Um, but holding that close um, while doing the best we can and disrupting as much as we can. And, and that means not only holding like our fellow ETAs accountable um, and the quote unquote system accountable, but also ourselves, right? In what ways are we, you know, potentially not doing right by the values that we are saying and we are pushing? Um, just because we joined DI does not mean that we are um, we're immune to failing, right? And like that means that hopefully, like you know, I think the best advice is like finding people who can keep you in check, who can who's willing to be honest with you, and like how you respond to that honesty. I think will speak volumes about like the total commitment to these values of justice. And I think one thing coming out of Fulbright was finding was being able to find those folks, right, to you know message and be like, hey, you know, like I'm thinking about this. Like, what are your thoughts about this issue? You know, um, and also kind of going back to the Taiwan context, like when we say like we support indigenous issues, for example. Um, in the context of Taiwan, um, how do we like as Americans, you know, ensure that we are supporting Native Americans and also supporting global indigenous struggles like what we're seeing in Gaza, right? Like, how do we use this position of power as ETAs um, and now Fulbright alumni to, you know, like respond to the current moment and and also, you know, think about, you know, when power wants us silent do we be silent, right? I think that's kind of maybe the common thread in all of our experiences in, in a smaller level with like administration, et cetera, right? Um, obviously good intentions, but they still represent a system, right? So um, in taking that, you know, once we leave Fulbright, in what ways do we accidentally stay silent, you know, in ways, in, in moments when we should not? So I think holding those values and those lessons dear um, has something that um, is something that I've been thinking a lot about. So, Lily is offering excellent advice and insights as always. And to answer your question, I believe it was Dara or Dara. If you're looking for something more self-driven, our DI committee task force didn't have any systematized educational resources because we were too burned out from helping out with COVID nineteen and launching it to create a curriculum but um we just um, like individually we just looked up news articles about for example the aboriginal communities and we reached out to the few aboriginal experts um aboriginal studies um or um, experts that Fulbright had and just leveraging the resources that we had as well just talking to our kids uh learning from the community doing go some googling reading some news articles just to bring in the indigenous stories into the classroom and i guess i would like to clarify my previous comment as like a closing word i don't regret what i did with dei and like uh, the only reason i chose to sell out and go for an mba is a master's of business administration is to continue this work in social impact but i do want to say that in terms of working 
in corporate world and to the administration, there is a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of respectability politics that I didn't do. I did it at first, I didn't do it later on, and it did have some impact, but I do not regret all the insights that I learned and the community that has been built and just learning all these nuances and dynamics from um, communities, like local communities and um, my DEI, my lovely DEI community. Oh, Lily's just dropped in the chat, looking into ethnic studies curriculum examples online to see what comes up. I would also suggest to you that, um, you know, if in your programs, you can always go to ask the program about different alumni who are on the foreign program side. Um, I know, for instance, in Indonesia, we have like so many amazing scholars that have gone and done their master's or PhDs in the States um, who talk about different issues of social justice in Indonesia. So, you know, if you can build a relationship with your program and ask them, hey, is there an alumni index with different topics of study that we can check out to contact some of these people who are in country who have worked on some of these issues? That's another way I think that you can connect sort of through the community side of things as well. Well, I don't want to keep everyone because I know everyone is like has super busy packed schedules as we're coming up on the holidays. We have people in med school, people in finals, all sorts of stuff going on. Thanks again for your time, everyone. Before we run off today, um, for all of our panelists, if you want to drop your preferred form of contact in the chat in case people do want to reach out to you later, that would be great. I'll also put my email there just in case folks who are logged in, tuned in tonight don't know how to reach me. Um, thanks again for those of you who attended and I look forward to the next time when we can all get together and, you know, share these things across the programs, because again, I think that the Taiwan DEI committees have been an amazing example of what um, grantees can do to really make this, you know, central to the program. Um, and I want to see it continue. And I hope that I can continue to adv advocate for this being like a more integral and institutionalized part of the Fulbright program in general. Thanks again for all of your amazing work, everyone.